official starting time. Okay, on behalf of uh, the Center for Marxist Education, and uh, this is part of the ongoing event, the 60s Cafe, and got merged with my Red Lecture History Series, so I'm not lecturing this month. I'll be part of the lecture next month, uh, with, likely with Nick on the collapse of the Second International. But uh, we have Ron Jacobs here, who's the uh, longtime activist, the author, uh, contributor to Counterpunch and the author of a book on the Weather Underground and other articles and books. So let's just give it up for him and take it away. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming out. This is kind of like fast today as everybody has reaffirmed. <laughs> um, it's nice to be here. This is kind of cool. I'm, I haven't been in a space like this in quite a while. Um, I live up in Burlington, Vermont now, and I usually stay in smaller cities. But um, what I'm going to try to do today, and try to do it in like as clear a, as possible, um, is kind of like provide like a radical synopsis of the period, say from like 68 to 74, primarily in the United States, but also obviously some of the stuff is international and so on. And you know, um, I'm going to try to do it from a left left libertarian, which is what I kind of perceive myself as, you know, perspective and so on. Um, just to give a quick rundown of what my history is politically is um, 69, 69, 70, I was, I, when I got involved in the anti-war movement and uh, in my, my father was in the military. Um, the first anti-war demonstration that I went to was on the moratorium in 69 and I just went to the local one. I didn't go to the one down in DC. I was living outside of DC at the time. Uh, my dad was in Vietnam. Um, mm. And then we, when he came back from, from Nam, um, I went to uh, the next demonstration I went to was the, the a day after demonstration, after the Chicago 7 conviction, and that was down in DC, and we went overseas. And I attended a number of anti-war demonstrations sponsored by German um, left and student groups and so on when, I, when my dad, we were stationed in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, and then when I came back to the States, I went to Fordham University for a little while, um, got involved with the Attica Brigades there, which was like the student wing of the Revolutionary Union, which eventually became the Revolutionary Student Brigade and RCP and all that kind of stuff. When RCP, when the Revolutionary Union um, decided, and the, the, the primary difference between the Attica Brigades slash R Radical Students, Re Revolutionary Student Brigades and the Revolutionary Union slash RCP was in order to be in the student wing, you just had to be left anti-imperialist. Anti you didn't have to toe, follow any particular party line, although it was obviously a place that they were using to try to encourage members to join, to join the parent organization. Um, so anyhow, that's, and then from there on, I just went in and out of like counterculture, um, anti-war, anti-nuke. Um, I got involved in a, um, a lot of like issues around I moved to Berkeley, California, and lived there throughout most of the 70s into the 80s, and um, got involved in that um, movement against El Salvador in the 80s, and the war in El Salvador, and um, against the Contra War. Um, had some interactions with different people when I was in Berkeley, um, but I'll be honest, a lot of time in Berkeley, I just kind of did like what a lot of fellow people did. I just did a lot of drugs, um, yeah, and, um, yeah, and went to concerts. I was involved on some level on a lot of um, like stuff around the homeless community, People's Park, um, and a lot of stuff around tenants, tenant stuff and so on in Berkeley and in Oakland. And I did, I still maintain contact with the RCP, and that's right when the split happened in the RCP, and the West, the West Coast branch were the ones who went with the Gang of Four. Um, and then in the 80s, I moved up to Washington State and was involved in a lot of, um, like I said, this stuff against the Central American Wars. and. Um, Then we started working. Then we started working on a lot of the stuff. Like in the late, well, I moved to Vermont in 1992. Before I left, we had been involved in a lot of organizing around um, far, farm workers, uh, student student rights stuff like that. Because I was working and going to school at Evergreen College out there. Um, and then in um, we started working on the 50 Years Is Enough campaign. And that's when I started writing a whole lot. That's when. Um, that's when I actually wrote my, was when I was at Evergreen, I wrote my original draft of the Weather Underground book then. Um, worked with some good people out there. And then I moved to Vermont and basically just got stayed involved in organizing labor unions at the University of Vermont. 
and uh, one was successful and two other attempts were. Um, and also, and of course, all the anti-war activities, both over, I was involved in the anti-Iraq stuff in the first Gulf War, and then of course a lot with the second Gulf War, and now we're heading into the third phase, it looks like, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back to start, I'm here to talk about that time period, I think. And I want to start off with a, uh, a quote from uh, Fear and Loathing of Las Vegas by Hunter <laughs> Thompson. And he's talking about, well, you can figure out what he's talking about. And I'll, here's the quote. There was a fantastic universal sense that whatever we were doing was right, that we were winning. And that, I think, was the handle. That sense of inevitable victory over the forces of old and evil. Not in any mean or military sense. We didn't need that. Our energy would simply prevail. There was no point in fighting on our side or theirs. We had all the momentum. We were riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. And then he continues the uh, wishful thinking. Um, now, less than five years later, you can go up on a steep hill in Las Vegas and look west, and with the right kind of eyes, you can almost see the high water mark, that place where the wave finally broke and rolled back. And that's kind of what I want to want to talk about right now. Um, this is obviously, it's, there's so much to talk about that I can only cover a small amount of it, and I'm going to try to do like an impressionistic thing. And if people want to interrupt, that's fine. That's kind of like the idea is to create a create a discussion. Um, I figure this is a relatively friendly crowd, so um, let me get back to my notes here so I can kind of remember what I was going to start off with. Okay, it's 1968. That's um, a year, pretty much one of the consequential years in human history. Um, it began with the uh, the Tet, Tet Offensive in Vietnam, which basically militarily, they the, the military historians claim it was a failure for the forces of the National Liberation Front and uh, North Vietnam, but politically it was a victory for them and it was a political defeat for the Americans. Um, from there, within three months of that time, um, LBJ had announced that he was no longer going to run for president um, and he would not accept, nor would he he would not run, nor would he accept any nomination from his party for the um, candidacy of the United, President of the United States. Within a couple of days of that, Martin Luther King was killed, um, and there was a insurrection throughout the United States, mostly in the inner cities. Um, there was a great little story about Boston and how they avoided the, the major riots because there was a riot because James Brown was giving a concert. Um, I guess, I don't know what, if it was at the Garden or where. Was it yeah, at the Garden? Yeah. yeah. And so you all, being Bostonians, you probably know the story. And it's like, you know, it's been retold, and like most recently they told it in the Globe, I think last year or something like that. And of course they gave it the Globe version of events. Um, but there were some similar things that happened like that out in, out in Oakland. Um, the Panthers were already pretty big, out, Black Panthers were already pretty big out there in Oakland. and. Um, they kind of kept a damper on the riots out there. Um, unfortunately, two days after Martin Luther King was killed, Bobby Hutton was killed by the Oakland police. Um, Bobby Hutton was the third member of the Panthers after uh, Bobby Seale and Hue Huey Newton. And uh, he was, depending on who you believe, he was killed in a shootout or he was murdered in cold blood um, by the Oakland Police Department. The Oakland Police Department was under instructions by their own people and by the United States government to take care of the Panthers before they spread. And as anybody knows that the campaign against the Panthers continued as they became a national organization and became one of the primary, if not the primary focus of COINTELPRO. Um, after night, then, so at April 6th, Bobby Hutton was killed. Um, meanwhile, an Elders Cleaver was shot. Elders Cleaver went underground. He ended up going to um, he got out on bail, I believe it was, and he ended up going to Algeria to open up the international wing of the uh, Black Panthers, but I'll more on that later. Um, then, um, uh, meanwhile, over in France, things were brewing, um, and by May, the beginning of May, there was a uh, major insurrection, student insurrection in France. It had begun and actually in Nanterre's over dorm rules, uh, because back then in those days, women and men not only couldn't live in the same dorm, there were very strict rules as to when they could visit each other. Um, and that, I mean, in most Catholic universities like BC, Fordham, when I went there in 73, they still had that rule for the women, like the, fresh, the first year women um, 
lived in their own dorm, and they had dorm house mothers, and like you had to sign in and out, and there was no men who were allowed in the dorm after nine o'clock. Um, it was the same case at Emmanuel College here. My was mother it here? Was in organizing so that's when the ones up there with the system, the five colleges and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 And um, but anyhow, by May, by the beginning of May, that had turned into a variety of political groups um, got involved. Among them were the Maoists and the Trotskyist organizations over there in um, in France. And if you can remember back then in France, the, the mainstream Communist Party was very strong, but it was like the Euro-Communism, soft communism. They ended up basically selling out the revolution at that time. Um, and uh, so people, some of the names you'll remember, Danny the Red, um, Dan Daniel Cohn-Bendy, he's now the multicultural affairs person. I think he's only working in Frankfurt now, but he was for a while um, for the whole um, country of Germany, but I think he's just back working in the city of Frankfurt. Um, and uh, meanwhile, in Germany, something comparable was going on, um, especially in Berlin. Berlin at the time was a divided city because there was East Germany and there was West Germany. Um, and the Shah of Iran had shown up there earlier and uh, the Shah of Iran was basically one of the ultimate tools of U.S. imperialism. Um, and the German students were organizing against the Shah, and during that time, a student was killed by the police. Uh, and after that, um, there was riots. Uh, Rudy Dutschke was, there was an attempted assassination of Rudy Dutschke by, um, by a painter um, and who was inspired by the ultra-right-wing newspapers owned by this um, Alex Springer family. Um, Alex Springer, if you wanted a modern, the, the Springer family still exists. They still have the best-selling newspaper in the world called Das Bild. Um, and it's a tabloid, it's a right-wing tabloid. Think New York Post, think Fox News. You know, it's, it's a, it's, he's the Murdoch of, of the German-speaking world, basically. Um, and uh, so he inflamed the right-wingers um, and there ended up being a student strike. The student strike spread to Western Germany. Uh, then at the same time, there, the anti-war, the movement in Germany against the, the war, the U.S. involvement in the war in Vietnam was, was growing. I mean, at the same, at, if you remember in Germany at the time, it was basically still under U.S. occupation. There was hundreds of thousands of troops in Western Germany. Uh, so the, a lot of times the protests took place outside of U.S. military bases. Um, from this from this milieu um, came um, various terrorist groups, one of them would be in the Red Army faction, Bader Meinhof Gang, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and they, I'll, I'll get back to them. Then, let's, if, if we come back to the United States in 68, um, I'm gonna, like I said, I'll miss some stuff. But things were starting to heat up in 68 because the Democrats were gonna have their convention in Chicago. The Yippies, SDS, um, and a variety of other groups were, um, organizing to have major anti-war protests outside of uh, the convention in Chicago. Richard Daly, Sr., who was the, the mayor, had refused to give them any permits because he wanted to set up a confrontation. Um, the confrontation occurred uh, in the famous Democratic Party, the riots and stuff. That's when, And the Yippies, who were basically six people, they were basically six people. They were like a, you know, if you want, they were kind of more like an agit prop group than they were anything else. Uh, the famous names are Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin. Um, there was also, and one thing that, be it, um, there was also a couple of women who were involved. Uh, Nancy Kershaw, who was married to um, Jerry Rubin at the time, and uh, Anita Hoffman, who was obviously married to Abby Hoffman. Uh, Roz Payne was another person. Um, she worked with, she ended up working with Newsreel, which was a uh, left wing. Uh, news organization. This is in the time before internet, obviously. So they would put together newsreels, and they would show. They would be shown once a week on different campuses and left-wing and countercultural gathering spaces around the country. Um, and they told the news from that perspective, as opposed to the mainstream perspective. Uh, the Yippies were created during an acid trip. And it was kind of an attempt to do, to take what the diggers had done in San Francisco, which was to politicize the hippies, the counterculture. And Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin had a lot of, and, and their female counterparts, had a lot of experience working in the anti-war and the civil rights movements. And, but then they started doing drugs and getting into rock and roll and decided 
we have all these basically lumpen youth who needed some kind of organization because they, they were opposing the war, they were opposing these kind of things because it was affecting them directly. Um, what was going on in Students for Democratic Society, which was the largest anti-war, white anti-war student group at the time, and they estimates there's never been a true count because a lot of people who called themselves SDS didn't have a membership card. Um, but they figure, most estimates guess that in, in the 1968 there's probably 100,000 members in campuses around the United States, mostly college campuses, some high school campuses. Um, there was also the beginnings of the Vietnam veterans against the war. That occurred in 1968. There was a, I think it was 68. There was a major anti-war march in New York City. And a vet who had, who had just gotten out of the service held up a sign that said Vietnam veterans against, Vietnam veteran against the war. And the Village Voice and the East Village other and a few other things took pictures of this, had a little, and some of them like gave his name. Vets started contacting him. And from there, basically, the organization was formed. And so it was very much a structuralist organization. Um, how much of that is true? How much of that is mythology? It's one of those things no one's really, really sure about. But that's the VBAW story, and we're sticking to it. Um, they, another, so by, let's say we're going to move to August 1968. Bobby Kennedy, who had been running out an anti-war platform, um, kind of taking taking the wind out of Eugene McCarthy's sails, who McCarthy was running on an anti-war um, platform, and his, although in terms of the more substantial differences between, the, if, there's, if there was a substantial difference um, between Kennedy and McCarthy was, Kennedy was more into providing social welfare programs than McCarthy. McCarthy was more of a libertarian when it, when it came to that kind of stuff. They were both equally opposed to the war and they were both obviously, you know, if you look at it historically, um, being used to siphon and diminish the, radic the radical aspects of the anti-war movement, because the anti-war movement was becoming more and more radical, looking more and more towards Marxism and anarchism, but especially Marxism um, for, for its inspiration and um, how to organize, and looking, and you know, so was Martin Luther King at the time. He had made the famous speech in April 4th, 1967, where he had gone beyond, where he came out against the war in Vietnam and started saying, you know, there, and started looking at things economically and realizing that he had to do a lot more than just, a, you know, reforms that it took a, a, it was going to take a fundamental change in the economic system in the United States. During the summer of 1968, the Poor People's Campaign had set up a resurrection city in, in D.C., and uh, that was part of what um, of what uh, Martin Luther King had wanted to do. It lasted for about a month, and then the cops came in and shut it down, uh, kind of like Occupy, you know, kind of like People's Park out in Berkeley, kind of like any other occupation that happens. Um, so we're in August 1968, the Democratic Convention. Uh, there had been hopes that there would be hundreds of thousands of people there. As it turned out, there was probably 10,000. Uh, it turned into running street battles for days, creating some of the most, some of the best television of the 60s, you know. I was like 13 years old at the time. I remember watching it with my, uh, with my mom. My mom was a big Democrat. My dad was a Nixonite. Um, he was off getting ready to go to war. Um, my mom was crying. But it was an interesting kind of like contrast to, to just to see this kind of stuff. Meanwhile, over in Czechoslovakia was the, um, the uh, Soviet spring had been quashed by uh, Prague Spring had been quashed by, quashed by the Soviet troops coming in to, um, to, to quash the reformist elements that, had taken, that, had, that were running the government, had taken over the government, the communist, the, the Stalinist government in, um, in Czechoslovakia. And basically, a lot of the reforms they wanted were, to, were just liberal reforms. To, not too many of them were economic, although some of them were economic. Well, it's I think, kind of, you know, it's kind of push for economic reform. Was, was that it? Yeah. It's, yeah. And that was the guru of economic reform that was an uh, economist named it was in Auto Six of my life. Yeah. And originally the, the main support for the reforms were based from the technocrats, enterprise managers of enterprises, professional economists. And that resulted in a, in a battle within the CP there. 
and both sides realized they they were going to have to appeal to, to the workers and to other groups. And so the old guard in the CP was telling the workers that these reforms would lead to unemployment and increased economic insecurity. So the economic reform the society they also had to promise things like political democracy and okay. democratic management of enterprises, things that they hoped would appeal to workers. And they also started talking about uh, increasing the civil liberties to, to appeal to intellectuals. So eventually it led to a shakeup in the uh, in the ruling, there, the ruling and that was yeah, yeah, became yeah. the uh, new boss. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so then we're in September, September 68. Um, and we can, we can kind of like move on from there. Um, I want to take a minute though to talk about a thesis by uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein. Um, and it's called, it's his whole, he has this, it's on anti systemic movements. And uh, some of you are probably familiar with it. He wrote a little book about that big, I don't know, you could probably still find it. Um, but if you do like a, if you go on to like a database or whatever, and you know, there's tons of, tons of magazine art, journal articles from the time where he talks about it. And he, he basically talks about what happened in 1968 around the world was a failed revolution in terms of overthrowing power, but it was, it, it was an anti-systemic revolution that basically changed the consciousness of of the world, you know, and, and uh, he, you know, he and, he and he talks about the, the main elements of it, being the main element being against the imperialism of the United States because U.S. imperialism was the biggest threat to humanity um, at the time and still is, um, and the other part was an anti the anti-bureaucratic nature of it, and so in that he tries to pull in what he knew about the cult the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Um, its origins and stuff, you know, and it's, you know, and then he also pulls in the rebellion in France. He throws in what was happening in the United States and in Germany. He brings in um, what happened down in Mexico during the student movement that ended up in the uh, massacre at the University of Mexico in Ch I can't say the, the, the Mayan word for it, um, where they killed 800 students right before the Olympics. He talks about the Olympics with the, the famous thing with John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Um, and and then he compares it to other moments. He talks, and what he compares it to is 1848, um, taking 1848 and 1870, um, the Paris Commune, and then saying, okay, those were moments that changed the course of human history, and then the overthrow, the change in power came with the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And then there's a couple, and I think another one that he takes is the, uh, the, uh, bourgeois revolution in France and so on in 1789 and then I don't know what replaces that perhaps the first Napoleon or something I can't I can't remember because I just looked over the thing real quick and then I lost my internet on the bus so yeah. um, so then we're okay well I talked I, I mentioned the Mexico what happened in Mexico uh, so also in 1968 on the, on the other side um, Richard Nixon got not got elected um, and it was a close election. Richard, Richard Nixon got elected. Um, Hubert Humphrey was the person who ended, ended the Democrat who ended up running against him. Um, and just like nowadays, you know, it's kind of like Hillary Clinton, George Bush. You know, it's, there really was no difference. Um, people debate that to this day. If you go to like New Left websites, or if you go to like, you know, I mean, you guys, I heard you talking about Carl and stuff. You know, and people still are talking about. You know, oh, we should have, maybe that was the biggest mistake. We should have supported Humphrey and all this kind of stuff, you know. And um, that's bullshit. But, uh, <laughs> but um, that's, that was, you know, and there was a big boycott the vote time at that, you know. Students for Democratic Society were real big on boycotting the vote. Um, the Panthers were the, you know, there was, there, there was, a big change that was happening in the white left, predominantly student left, um, the new left, they were moved, they had written a couple positions, their main newspaper for the Students for Democratic Society was New Left Notes, um, which started as a mimeograph sheet um, that was just sent out to chapters, and it was mostly an internal thing, but almost immediately afterwards they started one for the general membership, and also to like 
give away a cell, you know, to, to potential members, um, potential people at rallies and protests and so on. Um, and so it's probably best key by the, uh, best represented by the expression from resistance, from protest to resistance was the first one, and then from resistance to rebellion. And re resistance to rebellion was kind of what was going on at the end of 68. And there was also this new focus among the more Marxist-oriented members of the new left, of the SDS especially, to um, move, the, move the organization outside of the campus, and to, or especially outside of the more elite campuses, like where, where it had its broadest base, which would be a lot of the schools in Boston. BU was one of the, had a really big SDS chapter um, through the late 60s. Uh, Harvard had a fair one. Um, MIT had a decent sized one. Um, and then like other schools, but that's where it was mostly focused. It wasn't really into, I mean, there was chapters in the land grant schools and stuff. I'm, I'm talking about the coast. In the Midwest, the big chapters were places like Kent, um, uh, University of Michigan, Michigan State, uh, but that's it's a different nature of, of, of the, the specific cultures in, in, those, in those, um, those regions of the United States. Anyhow, so there's some names that you can remember is Mike Klonsky. Um, he lives in Chicago now. He works with the teachers union. In fact, I think he's a school teacher. Um, and Mike Klonsky was one of the main theoreticians in, this, in this, that, the SDS at the time. And then you have the, the names that most people know, Bill Ayers, Bernadine Dorn, um, the people who would end up becoming the, the weathermen. Uh, and they essentially agreed at the beginning, on, and there's people like Jay, John Jacobs, no relation, um, uh, Jim Mellon, uh, Ted Gold, Terry Rollins, um, and David Gilbert, a lot, those were a lot of the Columbia people. And, and they, um, they, uh, they are struggling for a way to, to organize working class youth. And first it, it involved trying to decide how to identify working class youth. And this is like one of the most confusing to me theoretical discussions that occurred in the, in, in the Students for Democratic Society. Um, I, can't, I can try to surmise it. If somebody has a better understanding, please jump in. Um, youth suffered a special oppression because of the draft, because most of the work they were able to get was low was low paid. You gotta remember at the time the minimum wage was like a buck an hour. Um, and very temporary, no, you know, no, no job security. Um, and then also they were, you know, and they were also just because they were young, you know, and like if, if they, as a counter, counterculture began to move and become the primary culture of the youth, you were harassed because you had long hair, because you smoked weed, because you went, because you listened to rock music. You know, it's, and then if you were non-white, you were, you had another specific oppression on top of that. Uh, so this was, the idea was to get to organize youth based on their own self-interest and their own class interest, as opposed to organize them in support of a third world country or, or African Americans or something like that. This brought up a lot of interesting things when people would go out into, um, when there would be youth riots in the various like hippie ghettos around the nation or on college by and the, get the strips outside college campuses and stuff when the cops would crack down on people partying and stuff um and that would be because like there was a lot of racism just like there is today um in, among white youth and i would say it was probably more back then in my experience i don't know i haven't been a youth for a while so it's hard to say hmm. um but um so they would this would bring up and this is key into weather, weather underground's, under, weatherman's understanding of the working class, because a lot of their interaction um, in, in, the, in 69, after they begin to decide that they were going to be weathermen and stuff like that, came out of some attempting to organize youth and run it into like incredibly racist elements that convinced them that work, that the, that the white people in the United States were just not worth organizing. They were, they were just useless, you know. And and Mike Klonsky and them, the, um, his groups, which became the Revolutionary Youth Movement too, they understood that it was just a t the, the that it was just the nature of United States society. 
and that it was something that they had to work with and figure out how to, re, you know, get rid of the, you know, change change their attitude to be in one of anti-racism to show, you know, do however they were going to do that. Um, am I making sense here? Okay. Um, let's see. Now we're going. I'm going to kind of run through. Actually, I'm going to backtrack. There was this guy named Carl Oglesby. He was one of the, um, he actually became president of Student for Democratic Society in the early parts of SDS 65, 66, when SDS went from being a group that was mostly organizing in the civil rights movement and in community action projects in Newark, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, and places like that, Chicago to becoming a, a major anti-war. Um, and he, he was working actually for some corporation um, where his job, and he was a grad, he was postgraduate, but he was a full-time employee of this corporation. And it was a corporation that had big contracts with the defense industry. And he was running data, um, measuring raindrops. He would, like they had some machine that would have, that would like drop, like spray rain out, and basically then he would measure the coverage of these raindrops. And when he found out the reason he was doing this was to see how how much Agent Orange the United they would need to drop from what height over Vietnam to get the most coverage. Um, when he realized what he was doing, that he he quit, became a recruiter for the Students for Democratic Society, and. Um, that he ended up being SDS for a long time. He was somebody in the SDS who ended up becoming more le becoming more libertarian um, than he, 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 he. In fact, his his um out of his memoir, which came out a few years ago, I think he um, was called Ravens in the Storm, and he really um, disses the Marxist wing of of, of SDS. Um, but this is something you'll find it, um, if you fought, look at SDS at all. There's, and if you read 60s history, there's a whole hierarchy. There was the good 60s, there was the bad 60s. And the part of the 60s I'm talking about is the bad 60s because they were the, they, did, they, they didn't want to just reform things, they wanted a revolution. And, it was, and, and they were, you know, they, were, they aligned, you know, it's the Black Panthers, it's the Yippies, it's the Weather Underground, it's the riots, it's, you know, all of the stuff that doesn't make for nice little story tales that you can say you were a community organizer and came out of kind of thing, you know. I mean, it's a whole different reality um, from what we're presenting, you know. Like Martin Luther King, as you know, they always stop right at a certain point and they never talk about his anti-capitalist stuff and his anti-imperialism and so on. And so in 69, 69 was definitely not a down year. Um, 69 things continued to to go towards some kind of critical mass. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, some of the key moments there uh, would have to be, well, the SDS convention in July. Um, I'll get to that and talk about that. Uh, the first, over, so if we go over to Germany, the first bombing, the first action by the um, what became the Red Army faction um, was a firebombing of a department store in in Frankfurt because that's where they were based at the time. And they, they it's a big it's a big um, department store chain called Kaufhof, which means buy place. You know, literally, it's a buy buy or whatever. And uh, the, the, they the communique they sent out to the newspapers said, "You shop while bombs drop." You know, um, which I'm sure is a familiar slogan to all of us here. You know, do your shop of all the bombs are dropping kind of thing. But they, and then they, from there is when they decided to make a move further underground. Um, France had, France was, well, Pompidou was, was the, was the um, prime minister of France or premier, whatever they have. And um, he, because basically due to some slick maneuvering by the CP and some of the labor unions and the French government, like I said, they forestalled what was potentially a revolutionary moment and um, turned it into a place where they got some higher wages for the workers and uh, the students went back to school, I guess. Um, they also tried channeling 
into support for the communist socialists in the, uh, in the legislative the, uh, of elections. The electorals, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. They, 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 got they got slammed. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And back to oh. you, Gaulus and his right wing allies won so big that when de Gaulle decided he wanted to make some reforms, he was getting blocked by his own allies. Really? That's because why, because the right wing was so powerful. So, strong on the oh. so that's, that's why he decided that he to go to, go to a referendum to get the, the power to rule by decree. And to get the reforms through that he wanted to push yeah, through. And he, uh, lost, and he, 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 had, he had promised he would resign as president if he lost the referendum. And he lost the referendum. And, and that's when he resigned. Okay. okay. Thank you. Oh. Also, like in the occupied six counties of Ireland, or what we call Northern thinking. Ireland, um, 68, there had been a civil rights movement there for the Catholic minority, it's explicitly modeled on like the US civil rights movement, where of course the racist loyalists there attacked them brutally. And it initially started among student circles, and by late 68 it was moving into like the Catholic ghettos, and then by early 1969, that's when you have the, the famous split within the IRA, and of course, like uh, that's when the provisional IRA essentially begins their major war against the occupying forces. And the quote unquote troubles. The, tr the quote unquote troubles. And of course, also in 68, 69, Italy has its hot right. autumn. Right. Right. You know, massive working class yeah. struggles, the rise of autonomism and, and right. whatnot. Right. And in Japan, there was major movement, major student movements against expansion of US military bases. and. Uh, and a variety of, of, of other anti-imperialist type of stuff. Japan doesn't get enough attention because those movements were going on since the 50s. Since the 50s, exactly. Right, yeah. right, right. So as, you know, and, and like I said, there's still other stuff that nobody, nobody's in, that hasn't been mentioned, you know, and it just kind of shows how pivotal a year that was. I mean, when you go to Europe, in Germany, they call it the 68ers. I mean, you know, here we call it the, um, something different, but in Germany they call it the 68ers. Um, so, and obviously the years are arbitrary. I mean, everything leaks over and leaks into and so on, but it's kind of like, as since we like numbers, you know, arbitrary numbers, it's kind of, it kind of works for that. Um, 69, let me see, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to jump in here. When was Sunday Bloody, bloody Sunday? That was 71. 71, okay, I do, I figured it was later, yeah. Um, so we had, I'm going to talk a little bit about the counterculture now. The counterculture was essentially an apolitical movement. I mean, there's, there's no pretending otherwise. I mean, it, um, and if you, th it, and it's basically, it had, if I were to give it, and it was basically a Western phenomenon. I mean, you, I mean, you could even say in some ways it's cultural imperialism. Um, and it was definitely, you know, and it's had its beginnings more or less in places like uh, the Bay Area, um, New York City, um, like, you know, the Lower East Side of the village, um, parts of London, and parts of Germany, I would say, were probably like, you know, um, and uh, probably the most famous stuff comes out of, comes out of San Francisco just because, the, the, you know, the, the groups that came out of there last, you know, like the Grateful Dead and so on lasts longer than pretty much anyone else and you can still go to the hate and it's a major tourist attraction and so on for for the city fathers um it you know and like if that's and when you think of like the people people associated with the, with a, with the counterculture and historical memory are people like timothy Leary, um rob doss uh jerry garcia um john lennon you know the beatles you know uh, um I don't know, there's, you know, like a bunch of other folks. There's, a, there's obviously some women there and stuff. I'm, I'm drawing some blanks and stuff. Um, it was a, it was in '68, '69, like with, and there was like I mentioned the group, the Diggers before. The Diggers were a small group that um, essentially anarchist. Um, they were in San Francisco. Some of their members, um, they, their members were members um, of the San Francisco Mine Troop, which was like a political, a political um, theater group that put on agitational theater in the parks of San Francisco. Um, and it was, a, it was man for a long time it was self-managed. Um, a lot of 
and there was a big theater scene in San Francisco at the time. I mean, you had Michael McClure going out there. There was all these, and that came out of the beat scene in the North Beach and so on in the late 50s going, going into the 60s. Um, Bill Graham, the, the rock promoter, was asked what, when the mime troupe started to need money and they, because they were getting bigger and they were getting more and more demands. They wanted to do a national tour, uh, to tour college campuses with one of their anti-war plays. Um, they got a, they, uh, they asked, Bill Graham volunteered to be their manager and it was actually the first time he had ever managed anything. Um, obviously he had a knack for it. Um, but he, um, so, so he kind of brought the mime troupe up into the next level. And then from there, he went to managing rock and roll shows. Um, the Mime Troupe, a lot of its members, they had a political split around the time Bill Graham came in. And some of its members left the Mime Troupe and joined a group of people that had already kind of started to exist in the late 60s, late 66, early 1967, right before the quote unquote summer of love, as the hate began to be flooded by uh, runaways and people looking looking for enlightenment and whatever else they were looking for. Um, and uh, they, what the diggers would do, the diggers, as you probably know, um, that it, it's an old um, group from, from the English Revolution. Is it like 16th century? 17th century. 17th century. And they basically, when, when the noble, nobility, and I'm guessing the, the new bourgeoisie or whatever, was trying to privatize the common lands, um, they squatted on the common lands. Is this more or less? Yeah, pretty much. More or less, yeah. And um, and they called themselves the diggers because they would dig dig up the land, I guess, and plant and so on. I'm not sure. But anyhow, what they did is the diggers of San Francisco. They they published communiques to to warn about you know rapists, bad drugs, so on and so forth in the street scene. And they would also go and put on free meals and free concerts on the Panhandle part of Golden Gate Park, which is right off of, right, right inside the, right next to one street over from Haight Street. Um, and they did that for, for about a summer or so. And they also organized a theater that was a people's theater, it was called Straight Theater, and it was a nonprofit. And they would try to get the bands to work with them and put on shows there for benefits and so on. Um, there was one guy there, his name, um, the Yippies. When you talk to the old hippies out there in San Francisco, they say that the hippies stole the idea, when in reality, it was just an idea that was needed to, to spread. Abby Hoffman and them decided to make it more political. Um, be, and Abby worked out of the, the Lower East Side and so on, even though he was originally from Worcester. Um, he, um, some of the names, Peter Coyote was, uh, was one of the original diggers. Um, Emmett Grogan, Emmett Grogan was a, uh, he was just kind of like this. He's got a great autobiography called Ring Olivio if you want to get a good sense of like the spirit of the counterculture. Um, I believe it's still publishable. You can definitely get it. Can you see that or, name of that book? Ring Olivio. It's like the children's, it's like a game that they used to play with a ring and a stick. Oh, and it's ring. called Ring Olivio. Olivio. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's basically his memoir, you know, and it's partially contrived because memory is memory. Um, they, uh, so anyhow, th that was the, the and the counterculture. You know, there was like like any other thing that was going on at the time. There was different elements of it. There was a capitalist element that wanted to figure out ways to make money and wanted to you know. And Bill Graham became probably the ultimate representative of that. You know, although he did a good job of putting on rock concerts and so on. Then there was the other side of it, represented in the in the rock world by the Family Dog, and their whole idea was to keep it community and to make it everything a cooperative. And they were, and then, and so this is best represented. They were a little, they had a little better political understanding. They didn't like Marxists because they thought Marxists were um, no fun, um, and they didn't like you know. And they, but at the same time, they were anti-capitalist, and they they were kind of drawing more from an anarchist sensibility, a communitarian sensibility, um, with the food co-op. That's kind of where the food co-op movement came from, and any other kind of you know like health food co-op, health co-ops, uh, free clinics all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, basically, a lot, as anybody who's looked at that movement knows, you know, they came up with the, the, they, by the late 70s, they came up against, you know, how do you maintain an anti-capitalist enterprise in a, in a capitalist system? It was kind of like, how do you maintain a socialist state in an imperialist world? I mean, it's like, you know, a little metaphor. Maybe. Um, but uh, 
So anyhow, the counterculture was becoming politicized, and the attacks were getting greater and greater. I mean, it was, I, I don't know if people can understand it nowadays. I mean, I don't know what everybody's individual experience is, but uh, if you ever seen, well, I don't know, um, if any of you came to Bob Nini's talk, which, you know, he does this great thing. He's a professor up at St. Mike's, so he, went, he, he grew up in Worcester too, actually. Um, but uh, he does this whole thing on the apocalyptic films of the 60s, and he talk, two of the ones he talks about are um, uh, Easy Rider, which ends with the, you know, the hippies getting their heads blown off by the rednecks in the pickup truck. And uh, then the other one he talks about is this movie called Joe, which is, uh, the movie ends with uh, Peter Boyle, he plays a working class guy who's just kind of like pissed off at the world, who teams up with this Manhattan executive whose daughter's become a hippie and is living with a junkie. And it's a pretty depressing movie, you know. Um, and at the end, the movie ends with, um, and this isn't a spoiler because it's still a good movie. Um, the, the movie ends with, um, yeah, right? <laughs> Close your ears if you don't want to hear it. With, with the fought with Joe, Joe, who's the Peter Boyle character, and this Manhattan business executive who's smart, you know, he's like a caricature. He's like so smart that you just want to take his time on that. But, um, and they, um, they go to the commune where his daughter's living, and the final scene is, he blows away his own daughter with a shotgun. So, so that's you know that's kind of like a dramatic take, but there was that hatred, that division existed on a daily level for hippies. You know, I mean, and people who grew their hair long, smoked weed, um, just kind of you know said fuck you to mainstream American society. Uh, Abby Hoffman, in his wisdom or whatever, uh, realized that and decided, and they decided to start organizing them. Um, around their special oppression of the draft and stuff like that. Um, so let's see, 1969 was Woodstock, Peace, Love, and Woodstock, and so on. Um, and the interesting thing about Woodstock is, as anybody who knows, you know, it's this great myth about peace, love, and roses, and you know. But in reality, I mean, Woodstock was sponsored basically by Warner Brothers. Um, pretty much every person, every band that played had some connection to Warner Brothers. Um, so it was basically a really great marketing tool, but at, at the same time, because it was overwhelmed, it did become representative symbolically, if not in real life, of something much greater because of the fact that basically, you know, like the movie says, it was three days of peace, love, and music, and all that kind of stuff. The, the, the yippies extorted the organizers. The yippies the extorted the organizers. So they, they said that you're, you're cashing in on the counterculture. Yeah. Um, give us access, and they they, they gave them had, the free. They, they had a tent. They had access to the to the stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then that's when the famous thing with uh, Pete Townsend, Townsend hitting, smack uh, smack in Abbey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they, you know, um, Roz Payne, who lives up in Ver up in Vermont, she was one of the original Yippies. She has some great stories to talk about that, and she she basically, you know, she she said that, um, in a way, it was really good for the more political of the Yippies because they realized that she goes in the long run, it probably helped them learn how to organize at least among the counterculture better because it, you know, you could go in there and just like tell people what to do. You had to learn kind of how to like have some give and take and find points of commonality instead of like, and you know, as anybody who's gone to leftist meetings knows, you know, a lot of times there's just like, there's no give and take. It's like, I'm right, you're wrong, and the other side saying the same thing. And you know, sometimes that's true. <laughs> but you know, there's good ways to do it. And I, and I think it was, kind of, and I think that's another aspect of what the women's movement did too, was like when, like when, for example, when men in the new left started being accused of oppressing women, their first reaction was like, fuck you, you know, like, I, you know, what is it, you know, but then when, when after, after those initial reactions, those men who, you know, actually thought about it and, and, and listened to the criticisms and the critique and so on, and, and were able to do some self-criticism themselves, um, learned that, oh yeah, I am capable of oppressing women somebody based on who they are or what they are or whatever and it actually created a, 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 broad, a great, I think a greater understanding of, of humans and possibly and ideally you know in the best situations um, 
helped organ organize it. You know, um, I mean, that's up for debate. That's just my, you know, that's kind of like what I have observed and felt and stuff like that. Um, back to the counterculture, 1969, Berkeley, California. Um, the Berkeley Bar, which was uh, the main underground newspaper there at the time. The underground newspapers were like the internet, um, and I might be saying this all out of like a nostalgic thing, but better. Um, they, there's, there's, you know, Boston had a couple of very good ones and a couple that were pretty shitty, um, just like every other big city. Um, Boston had a, geez, the Phoenix used to be an underground paper. I don't even think it exists anymore. Right? It's yeah. gone. Yeah, and the Old Mole, which was much more political. That was a, that was primary. Help me out here, Jim. Was that like an SDS? That was a, yeah, Boston was a yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. And that was a really good political paper. They had a good, I, I really liked their line. Um, but uh, then, you know, the Berkeley, Berkeley had the Berkeley Tribe, which was much more political, and the Berkeley Bar, which was run by this autocrat who basically chased half the people away, mostly the women, because he was a sexist pig. Um, but he, um, it was the main paper for the for the Berkeley counterculture community at the time, and the, somebody, oh God, let's just, I can see what he looks like. Oh, he put a little, he's one of the, oh, Michael Bellancourt. Um, he, he put a little thing in the paper, in, in the front page of the Berkeley Bar, and it was a weekly, that said, come to the park, no, come to Haste and Telegraph, we're gonna turn the parking lot into a park. And it was a piece of land, you might, I don't know how well you know this story, but it's a piece of land that was owned by the University of California. And you see, the University of California is one of the most reactionary university board of regions still to this day. I mean, I can say that, you know, just having been there and having seen how they treat the rest of the state, and especially the city of Berkeley. And you gotta remember at this time, Ronald Reagan was, was governor of uh, California, and he had his own issues. Um, and he, um, at the time in, in Berkeley, there was a uh, third world strike going on at, at, at the University of California, Berkeley. And the third world strike was to try to get third world studies into, uh, as part of the curriculum um, in, in, at UC. Um, and it was based on the third world strike that had taken place in San Francisco State the year before uh, that had been brutally repressed by the police. Um, so anyhow, there's this piece of land and it's located between Haste and Dwight Way, a block off of, um, behind the building on Telegraph Avenue. Telegraph Avenue is kind of like the main drag, it's kind of like Harvard Square it was in the 60s and stuff. Um, and they, they um, the university, there had been, been a bunch of student housing there that was never maintained and so it's kind of like the Bohemian Quarters. This, the university eventually tore it down because they found out that a lot of the radicals lived in those quarters, and so they figured, well, we'll get rid of their neighborhood. And so they took and they turned it into a parking lot, supposedly. But it basically was just like a dirt, empty, vacant lot. And one one Thursday, people showed up, like hippies, political radicals, Black Panthers, people from the neighborhood, school kids from the schools around there and just started, and landscapers came in and they just started building a park. And it was a park for a little while, and then um, Reagan and the regents decided to take it back, and, and it, you know, there was a huge, the, there was a huge riot. Um, James Rector was killed, several other people were wounded by buckshot. Um, the riots went on for several days, and then, you know, the National Guard came in. Uh, Ronald Reagan uttered his favorite, Famous words. If they want to, if, they, if there's going to be a bloodbath, let's get on with it. Um, he's still a big. They still love him in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, but anyhow, that was a countercultural event, and that was a moment where the where the left, um, where the where the radicals, the political radicals, and the counterculture pulled together and kind of realized they had a lot of common interests. Of course, a lot of the original organizers were people who had roots in the anti-war movement, in the civil rights movement. Yeah. What year was that? Then? 1969. 69. Yeah, May 69. Yeah. Um, the, the park started, like, I think, I think the first attacks on the park were May 2nd, and it went on for about a week or so, um, including, you know, aerial dropping of tear gas. It was one of the first major kettling actions 
in on the white student left. There, uh, there's a huge rally on on uh, Sprawl Plaza because um, that's where they had the rallies in Berkeley, um, and it was the second set of huge rallies. And all of a sudden, the cops just started surrounding um, all the all the exits, and then the helicopters flew over and started dropping tear gas from the um, from the uh, from the sky. One of the more interesting things that came out of that was a taxi company called Unlimited Taxi. And what it was was it, that came, the, the, the mainstream taxi companies refused to take any of the wounded to the hospital. So people just started um, going and getting their cars to take ferry people to the local hospitals, um, the ones who couldn't be treated by the medics at, at, in the battle sites. Um, and from there, it became a, a, a taxi cooperative. And they would just get junkers and make them work forever. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, okay, then, okay, we're gonna, then we're gonna jump to Woodstock. Um, out of Woodstock came a couple ideas. Uh, Abby Hoffman wrote a book called Woodstock Nation. Um, and his idea was that even though it wasn't a nation in that it held ter territory, um, it was a nation that, that was in our heads. And it, like, you know, it, it, it meant the liberation, you know, it was a liberated nation, um, so on and so forth. Um, Erwin Silver, who was a guy who started at um, Guardian? He was a Guardian guy. And um, he was also, was it Sing Out? One of the, yeah, Sing Out, okay, which was an old folk music magazine, uh, a lefty folk magazine. I actually think it might have been, correct me if I'm wrong, it was an offshoot of the CP, the Communist Party, I think. I'm not positive, but I think it was, or at least founded by members, elements of the Communist Party. Um, and he, he put together this little pamphlet um, looking at it from his perspective, a left perspective, of why it did not fit, why it wasn't a nation, and why the countercultural revolution, counterculture was not a revolutionary culture. So there was this whole debate, and then I found some things when I was looking on the internet a few weeks ago. Um, there was this old magazine called Radical America, really good magazine, um, volume two, volume two, issue 16. You can find, it's all archived online now. Um, it's all PDF and stuff like that. And it's on. Back here somewhere. Oh, cool, cool, yeah. It's, I used to subscribe to it, it's a great magazine. My dad always wondered when it would come in the brown paper wrapper and stuff to the house, but still, you know. Um, but it's got a great, that issue is all about the discussions around culture from a left perspective. So if you're interested in that more, and on the counterculture especially, and why, and, and it's quite, you know, whether it had revolutionary potential and so on. Um, so at this time, now we'll go back to like the political side of things, the new left, what were they discussing, um, the white new left. Um, they were discussing that the 69, July 69 had seen the weather, had seen the last real um, SDS convention. It took place in Chicago, July 1969. Um, it ended up splitting SDS forever um, into, the, into two, then three factions. Um, the first two factions were the faction that would become Weathermen, um, and they announced their arrival by passing out a position paper um, called You Don't Need a Weatherman to Know Which Way the Wind Blows, obviously stolen, take, the title taken from Subterranean Homesick Blues by Dylan, um, because Terry Robbins was a big Dylan freak, and so, you know, and he was on, there was 11 people who wrote that, um, most of the people that you associate with the name Weather, Weather on the Ground. Um, and then the other, the other section was the, the faction that was Progressive Labor Party, um, PL. Um, Progressive Labor Party um, was a Maoist offshoot of a Maoist offshoot of um, the CP. They had been kicked out of the CP in the 50s, I believe, because of I guess it must have happened during the Sino-Soviet split. Um, but anyhow, um, and PL was kind of like, you know those guys, I, the way they looked to me, anyhow, you know, I wasn't at this convention, I was too young, but when I met someone later, the way they looked to me was like, you know like how Mormons have to do missionary work? <laughs> <laughs> and they walk around and they have that little thing that says elder, this, this. that's what they, because they were told, they they were totally against the counterculture, they, they, they were, their viewpoint, they're against nationalism um, because they consider it to be reactionary. And I mean, there's some aspects to that that are, you know, it's just how you understand what you mean by nationalism. So because they were against nationalism, they were also against the Black Panther Party. They were also against most third world um, 
third world. Colonial struggles? Huh? Neo-colonial struggles? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And um, so they basically, the second or third day, and there was a lot of other stuff going on at the convention. I'm trying to simplify it. I mean, there's still, people are still talking about it, the people who were there and so on. Um, whether the people who would be, Bernadine Dorn led a bunch of people out and they went and met somewhere else. And when they came back, they essentially threw out, threw PL out of the part, out of the SDS. One of the contentions was that they were attacking the Black Panther Party, right? That they were, that, 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 that PL's critique of nationalism amounted to some kind of like, kind of like intolerable attack on, on, the, Black on the Black Panthers, yeah. right? So that, yeah. so that was, and the, that was basically, was, yeah, it was a key. Yeah, that was key to it, yeah, yeah. More so than the counterculture or anything like that. Because Weather Underground still wasn't sure about the counterculture. I mean, mo to be honest, I would say probably a vast minority, if not a clear majority, of the rank and file of SDS, they were already, the counterculture was part of their daily reality. You know, because they were just, they were college students, you know, they were hanging out, you know, they went to anti-war stuff, they were politically involved on some level, but they smoked weed and listened to rock and roll. I mean, you know, that's what you do when you're a kid. Especially that, you know. Um, but uh, they, uh, they, um, so that was the only, af after they kicked PL out of, out of the SDS, they, they finished up their meeting. Um, and really, the only two calls they, they came out was to have protests um, in the fall in Chicago um, to mark the Chicago 8 trial, which the Chicago 8 trial was eight men. Notice men, this is always a very, I mean, it's all men. This is like really interesting in terms of like how the new left, you know, um, organized itself and also the nature of the culture at the time. It was still like a much more male oriented culture than it is now. Um, they, uh, eight men who were indicted by the Nixon Justice Department um, for crossing state, conspiracy to cross state lines with the intent to incite a riot among the numerous other charges. And that law itself was called the H. Rap Brown Law. H. Rap Brown was a black nationalist who had been temporarily part of the Black Panther Party, um, who had been indicted um, for going to uh, the eastern shore of Maryland, um, Cambridge, it's a little town, historically racist, slave town and stuff. And he went there and gave a speech and the black people rose up there and then he left and uh, so anyhow, they named this law. It's the Interstate Riot Act or something like that. But it was it was familiarly known as the H. Rap Brown Law. Um, so they indicted these eight eight men. Um, let's see, it was Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, the Yippies, the counterculture, um, John Freund, who was a physicist. He was SDS. Uh, Rennie Davis, who was SDS. Um, David Dillinger, a very famous radical. Um, pacifist, um, uh, I mean, very famous. He, he taught at Yale. He went to Yale. He, did, he went to Yale. Right, he went to Yale, thanks, yeah. Um, trying to remember who else was Tom Hayden? Tom, thank you, yeah, who was the, uh, totally identified with SDS. He was one of the founders of SDS and very uh, crucial in the student movement. Um, Bobby Seal, Black Panther, and then there was one other. Did you already say Rennie Davis? I did say Rennie Davis, yeah. yeah. There was one other guy, I can't remember. But the idea was to represent all elements of the new left, and then they threw in a panther. Um, and the, you know, the pro one of the best lines that came out of the trial was uh, at a press conference, Abby Hoffman said, conspiracy, hell, we can't even agree on lunch. Yeah. So, um, and they, they organized, they got a really good team of lawyers, William Kunstler, very famous left-wing lawyer, uh, Leonard Weinglass, who was historically the lawyer for the Panthers. Um, and uh, was Boudin involved in that too? Was Lenny Bodine involved? I can't remember. Um, but they, they had this incredible team of, um, of left-wing, very, very, very good lawyers. Uh, the trial started in um, late September 69 in Chicago. There was a huge protest um, in Grant Park, which was the scene of the, the street fighting at the Chicago Convention a year before. Um, and it was attacked by police, and there was a major, major riot. A week later, there was the Revolutionary Youth Movement II, which was the split. When, after that, to go back to that convention of the SDS, um, they both, 
they split the revolutionary youth movement, which was Weather Underground and everybody else who opposed the Progressive Labor Party. Um, they uh, split again. It was a lot over organizational and also an understanding of the role of radicals and white people in the United States. Um, and so they both issued their own separate calls for protest you know, in, in Chicago. Um, the uh, protest that the Revolutionary Youth Movement too, which was a lot of people who would end up becoming intimately involved with the new communist movement in the 70s, especially Revolutionary Union, um, the Patriot Party, a bunch of these various formations. And then the other group was Weather, Weather Underground. Weather Underground's own leaflet said, bring the war home, you know, and like they said that, that silhouette of like the Viet Cong with, with the uh, holding, up, holding up a rifle. Um, the other group was working with um, the, Pan the Chicago Panthers, who included Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. But, um, and they worked with the Chicago Panthers and with various um, radical elements in, in different um, unions in Chicago. Um, and they, so the both groups held protests. Uh, the more famous, because of the media, were the Days of Rage, which is what the Weathermans became. Um, although the ones that attracted many more participants were, was the RYM2. Uh, the Days of Rage ended up... Um, would you say there was a slogan, I'm sorry, would you say there was a slogan or a line that RIM2 represented at that point that you could counterpose, or was it not? Um, serve the people. Yeah. I would say it would be serve the people, you know. And basically by this time, Weather Underground was saying fight the people because all the white people in the United States are racist, but except there's for us. Serve the people shit, was not that? Yeah, 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 right, right. yeah. And so, I mean, if, if you want to look at that, I mean, people always look at the Weather Underground at this particular time because the weather, weathermen and the Weather Underground, I think you could say are two different things, really. But the weathermen, um, it, more than anything, and this is one of the things, the, um, the Guardian, which was an in independent left-wing newspaper at the time, that Carl Davidson was intimately involved with, um, and, and, a seven, and a few other people, or so was another one. Um, they, Davidson had one of the best lines about the Days of Rage, um, I think it was him who said that, where they basically serve, you know, while they may show how it is to be militant, they were basically, actually it wasn't Davidson who said that, but um, something about that they were basically serving the frustration of people in the movement with the fact that no matter what they did, they couldn't stop the war, and Panthers were getting killed more, and you know everything was just like, you know, and he was, you know, and it's kind of like it can go back to like Lenin's thing about ultra leftism, and you know, where do you make your alliances? How long, you know, when is the revolutionary time? And that's a something that kind of, I think this whole period is marked by, is this sense that revolution was right around the corner, um, when in reality it wasn't, obviously. Um, but, uh, and this fueled a lot of the splits in the, in the left at the time. It fueled what was the split in the Panthers between um, the Oakland wing, the Huey Newton people, the Elders Cleaver wing. Um, Elders Cleaver aligned themselves with Weathermen and then eventually Weather Underground, and they basically said that it was time for a revolution and that you were going to have to, you know, you had to go out, you had to make, you had to commit, um, oh, what's the line, um, acts, propaganda acts. Um, propaganda of the deed? Propaganda of the deed, thank you. Um, and, you know, you, you, whereas the other side was much more, you know, you need to, you, you need to create a mass base before you go out and start engaging in armed struggle. And Weather originally started with that idea, but they never, they, they grew frustrated too quickly and never did that. Um, December, December 4th, 1969, will be 25 years ago this year, um, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were killed by the Chicago cops and the FBI in basically what was a death squad assassination. Um, he was drugged by the former um, and uh, killed while he slept. He was, they were getting, they was giving phenol bars. Um, and the, the line of the cops uh, was that they were fired on and that it was a shootout. But uh, the Chicago Panthers and other leftists, before the cops came in and had time to clean up the crime scene, they went in and formed an armed guard around the crime scene. And uh, of all the bullets that were in the door, only two were coming out. 
and all the other ones were going in, and we're talking like lots of bullets went in, and there's a pool of blood. Um, he had his wife, and his pregnant wife was in there at the time. She was okay. Um, there's a great film called Fred Hampton. Murder, of, murder, murder of, of Fred Hampton. Um, it's really good, and I'm sure it's it's available on the internet, um, and I'm sure you'll it'll start people start talking about it since this is the is the forty fifth forty fifth anniversary of the of the murder. Yeah, um, it's December. Yeah, December fourth. Yeah, and uh, this this what what that meant to like elements on the white left was it really showed the difference in how. COINTELPRO work depending on what color you were. Mm -hmm. um, and th it's part of what convinced Weather to go even, all, even more into the armed struggle thing. And a lot of this all came out of a, a debate that had been occurring since before Columbia, the Columbia Uprising, but it got really heated in the Columbia Uprising because it was the propaganda of the deed versus educate to organize. And uh, they, so they had the action faction in SDS, which was you take over things, or you, you, you create this act, and then people, that's a way of organizing. And so that's a debate. The other side of it says, well, you can organize all these people, and they're going to come out, and they're going to oppose police repression and so on. But unless they have an anti-imperialist analysis, which you can only get by long-term education, once, once the repression seems to have gone away, they're going to go back to their, to their regular life, and then you're back to the core. It's an open debate, and that's a simplified take on it. Um, Ron, right around this time, that's, that's when Eldridge Cleaver, he wrote the open for, for Jerry Rubin's book, mm -hmm. The Yippies, who, mm -hmm. who Abby and him always spoke very favorably of the Weathermen and the kind yeah, of yeah, well, the Black Panthers. Yeah, like, yeah. Was that, could you talk about that a little bit? About I think I think Abby saw, because he dedicated Woodstock Nation to weather, weather Underground, Weathermen, and he said, like, any proceeds I get, I'll give to the Weathermen. And supposedly he gave him, like, five grand or something like that. Um, he, um, I think they, I think this was at a time when Weather Underground was really start. They were, they had made this decision that they were going to become countercultural revolutionaries, and so they jumped in big time. They you know, and uh, they had alliances through mutual mutual friends, you know, with with Abby, Abby and and, and, and Jerry and and the other people who were in. in the Yippies, um, and uh, on a on a class basis, you know, I, I think this is an oversimplification, but I would say it just represents the petty bourgeois aspects of both the Yippies and 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 weather, you know, and and that they both wanted the revolution to happen right away, you know, and. Uh, did the Weather Underground free like Tim O'Leary? That, that happened later, yeah. and that was yeah, yeah, and that was part of this to whole Algeria with Eldridge. With, with Eldridge, and that yeah, and that happened like about a year after because they had the Flint Council, the War Council, in December sixty in December sixty nine. That um, that's when they decided to go all. That's when they decided to go underground, and that's when they decided that um, and that's when they were starting to lean towards the counterculture, but they still had. You know, there was still a debate within within the within the group about whether or not they were going to, you know, be the counterculture. And then those books came out in '70. Both those books, Do It and uh, and uh, Woodstock Nation, and they were both, like you said, showed that there was this alliance between the Yippies and, and, and Weather Underground. And then in March March 7th, 1970, after the townhouse explosion in New York City, is when they went underground. And then they started. Um, then by September 13th, which is when they released, when they freed Timothy Leary and scooted him out of the country um, over the course of a few days, uh, that's when they released the New Morning, oh, and then in December 1970 they released the New Morning Communique, which was basically when they presented themselves as the revolutionaries of the counterculture, and the counterculture as, what was it, the line is, Timothy Leary said, Timothy Leary said, revolutionaries are freaks and freaks are revolutionaries, and that was the line. Um, in between, and I think this is part of what convinced the uh, push, push weather more into that line, um, first was the fact that after all those three people died in the explosion, was they started to realize what they called the military error. But also what they, um, was 
1970 was a pretty impressive year in terms of the mobilization that occurred. And a lot of that happened because of uh, Richard Nixon's the invasion of Cambodia in, in April, which brought out tens of thousands of people. There was already a big protest in uh, Yale going on that weekend um, because Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins were on um, trial for charges that they were eventually acquitted of. They were trumped up charges um, brought by the you know, as part of the COINTEL operation to COINTEL operation to destroy the Panthers. Um, and when it became, the protest in Yale was kind of, you know, it was a peaceful protest for the most part. And then when word came down that Nixon had invaded Cambodia, um, they immediately formed a strike committee and issued a, a nationwide call for a strike. Within four or five days, most of the, over two thirds of the colleges in the United States were experiencing some kind of protest or actual shutdown. Um, in Kent, that's when the four students were killed at Kent. Um, and in most other schools, there was major riots. Several ROTC buildings were burned down. Um, and just at that time, there was a wave of like propaganda of the D. I mean, there's a there's a map that Scanlon's monthly put out. Scanlon's was like a short-lived left-wing counterculture magazine that Andrew Kopkin was involved with and a few other left radical journals. Um, and it showed all the reported firebombings, bombings, everything that had occurred in one year in the United States that were from left organizations, left slash anarchist organizations. And it was quite a bit. You know, so Weather Underground was just one element. They were just one of the more well-known and more organized groups that did so. Um, Overseas, what was going on was more related and less, more like Europe was still pretty hot. Um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, one can compare the United States and, and, and Europe in some ways, but Europe has a completely different history in terms of, uh, in terms of politics anyhow. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of the Western European nations and, and people are, are politically more cognizant that Americans tend to be anyhow. Um, um, so I don't really know what I want to say. I mean, the Red Army faction was doing their <coughs> bombings. Um, the Red Brigades in Italy hadn't started yet. The Angry Brigade in, in England was, was doing its small bombing campaign. Squats were starting to be a pretty big thing in, uh, in England and I in, in certain cities in Italy. In Germany, they were just beginning. The first major squats really started taking place in 71, 72 in Germany. Um, and uh, that's another thing where, like, as, as Anna referred to, the autonomic kind of came out of that. Well, also in, like, Western Europe, you'd see these huge strike waves, like in Britain, which would go through the 70s and bring down, like, various governments. And even in Spain and Portugal, which were under which fascist, were fascist, which regimes, were under yeah. fascist yeah. regimes, the strike waves in Spain were equivalent to what was going on in England. Of course, Portugal was involved in its colonial wars too, which you know radicalized its army. Right, right. Which eventually brought the, 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 the Rose, regime down. Was it the Rose Revolution? The, the Carnation the Revolution. Carnation Revolution. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, at that time, I was going to high school over in Germany, um, and. Uh, you know, it was it was a good time. I, mean, I didn't live on a military base, so to speak. I spent a lot of time at the uh, University of Frankfurt. Um, so just some impressions of that time. Um, we I worked with GIs. We published a paper called "Fuck the Army," um, and it was just part of the FTA. I did the distri distribution and so on um, because the GIs, if they got caught with it, would end up getting thrown with a brig or the stockade or whatever. Um, a, a big movement that saw that was international in scope, and that saw elements of the counterculture from the from the royalty, the people like the Rolling Stones and the Beatles, all the way to the rank and file, was the movement to free Angela Davis. Angela Davis was a was a member of the Communist Party USA. She um, she was a uh, intellectual. She had studied under um, Herbert Marcuse who was a very well-known um, left, new left um, philosopher out of the Freudian, that was a, the Frank Frankfurt school. school, which blended Freudian, Freud and Marx and so on. Uh, well, good stuff. I mean, his, 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 his books are like crucial to a, a, 
pretty cru I think crucial to an understanding of a lot of modern culture, modern society, you know. Um, but she, um, she had been teaching at one of the branches of UC, University of California, I want to say UC San Diego, but I can't remember. Um, she now teaches at UC Santa Cruz. She has some, she's a full tenure professor and so on. Um, she, um, and Ronald Reagan, just, she was up for tenure, and Ronald Reagan decided to go after her because she was a communist, and she was working more and more with the Black Panther Party. Um, now the Black Panthers at the time, there was a prison, there was a prison movement coming up. The, the, more and more prisoners were becoming radicalized. This was in part because more and more radicals were getting thrown in prison, but also at the same time, you know, the Panthers, given their their base, which was the ghettos of America, um, the African American ghettos of America, I mean, they a lot of people were people who had been somehow connected with the pri with the prison system in the United States. Um, so they had a good, a pretty good analysis going on about the, the function of prisons in, in capitalist America. Um, so that helped to radicalize the prisoners as well. Um, there was a, a group of prisoners called the San, San Soldad Brothers. Um, there was four prisoners who had been accused of killing a guard in Soldad Prison, which is a prison out in the desert in California, in southern, South Central California. Um, nobody really knows. It was never really resolved who killed the guard. The guard was a known racist guard. I mean, that was kind of a standard thing to have racist guards in with the, with the mostly black and Latino prisoners. Um, and so, but, but because Jackson and the other prisoners, uh, Michelle McGee, uh, I can't remember the other two guys' names, were, some were known in the, as prison organizers, they were brought up on the charges. They were moved to um, San Quentin Prison, and uh, a big movement began around them to kind of like free the Soldat brothers. Uh, one of the main prisoners was a prisoner named George Jackson, a Black Panther named George Jackson. Um, he had written a book called um, Soldat Brother, the letter, Prison Letters of George Jackson, which became an international bestseller. Um, he, uh, him, and, him and Angela became lovers. Um, and she became actively involved, in, along with the Black Panthers, in the campaign to free, free George Jackson. Um, so she became very good friends with George Jackson's younger brother, a, a young man named Jonathan, who was in high school. Um, and on August 7th, 1970, he, during, a, during, a, during the trial of the Soldat brothers, George Jackson wasn't there. Um, but during the trial, he got into the, into the court, courthouse and he, he was armed. He took prison, you know, he, he came up with a bunch of guns. He took some prison, took the judge, judge and some members of the jury and a couple of clerks. He took a prisoner, taped him up. They went down into the way this court, it's a, the courthouse is set up in Marin is there was like a tunnel that they parked the, the prison truck to, to bring up the prisoners in an, in an elevator. It was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but uh, so he, they took, they took the, they took their hostages down to the van and even though they, the cops and the prison guards have been told not to fire at the van, they let loose with the fusillade of bullets and pretty much killed most of the people in the van. Um, and uh, about a, it must have been like a few days later, um, Angela Davis got indicted um, for murder and, and conspiracy to commit murder because she, the, some of the guns were registered in her name. Um, and she went underground. She was arrested in, 19, in October 1970. Um, a movement grew, grew to free her, free Angela Davis. It was, a, it was a huge movement. I mean, it was international. It was supported very strongly by the CP, the International Communist Party. Uh, I remember going to a rally, must have been like 19, I don't know, I was in maybe 1971, um, and uh, in Frankfurt, and it was, it was a big rally. Um, her sister was. She had a, her sister Fania was on an international tour to raise funds, and the Frankfurt rally was the last stop before they were, were going to go over to East Germany. And, she, and Angela was like a hero in East Germany. There's still there's like streets and everything named after her. Still, even though it's no longer East Germany, um, and you know the rally was a combination of like international Black Panthers, working people, and a bunch of old German communists. Um, so it was, it, was, it, was, it was cool, um, but there are songs. I mean, John Lennon, John John and Yoko put out a song about Angela Davis. Um, 
the Rolling Stones put out a song about Angela Davis, it's on their, their exile on Main Street. You know, I have no idea if the money either of those guys made, any of it went to the Angela Davis fund, but we'll assume that they were good and that they gave some money to the, to the fund. She was freed, um, she was, she, all of the charges, she was acquitted, um, I, I think in 1972, I want to say. Um, but in large part because of the popular movement around her. Um, and that was one, that was a moment when everybody, the counterculture and everything kind of pulled together for, for, for the movement. Um, I think. Which, uh, uh, which Stone song are they talking about? Um, the oh, what's it called? She's a sweet black angel. Sweet black, sweet angel? black angel, yeah, yeah. It's a weird Mick Jagger take on things. So just yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But never, but it is. I've never picked up. Yeah, it. but it is a, like if you go back and like look at like do like you can probably like some interviews that he did around that time. He talks about Angela Davis, but it's a weird Mick Jagger sexist yeah, take. Yeah, on yeah, things, yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Totally fine. Yeah, yeah, totally yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Lennon is. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, yeah. The Lennon Yoko so, one. Sure. What song would that be? It's called. Um, I think it's just called Street Angela, and it's on Sometime in New York City. That uh, the one that looked like a newsprint thing. That yeah, um, yeah. And go talk about the Dylan song, 1971. After George Jackson was killed, August in August 1971, uh, Bob Dylan went right into the um, studio and recorded a song called George Jackson. Um, it's a simple ballad. You know, it's, it's got a couple good lines. You know, some of us are prisoners, the rest of us are guards. You know, stuff like that. Um, it was D Dylan's only, the only other political song he did in the 70s, overtly political, was the one for Reuben Carter. Um, that was on the Desire album, you know, Hurricane. Mm -hmm. um, and I could go into this whole thing about the counterculture and stuff like that, but that's my next book, so go ahead and get it. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to like the political side of things. You know, oh, there was one other move. You know, the Cross of Steel's Nash and Young released the song Ohio. Like mm -hmm. it was the same kind of deal as Dylan releasing um, George Jackson. That was another complication of the counterculture and uh, and uh, the politics. And they went into the th into the studio, recorded it, put it out two days later. Um, and that's a little side note on that story. I don't know if you know this, but. I, I was over in Germany, and they they, they would play it. They played on on over Germany at the time. They had a, and they still have it. Although now there's a television series. It was called Armed Forces Network. And like if you ever saw the movie Good Morning Vietnam, the Robin Williams flick, they had the same thing in Europe. Um, and it was it was run by the military, um, and they had DJs that were GIs, and they had syndicated shows. Um, and in order to maintain the GI audience, especially at that time because it was so many draftees and because of the counterculture, they had several shows like after like 10 o'clock at night that were, um, they called them like underground, you know. So it was like album, album cuts, you know, like that's the first time I ever heard Corey the Crimson King. It's the first time I ever heard Joe Cocker do well. It was a little help for my friends. But they played, they played Ohio um, the day that they got it and two days later the GI who played it was fired from his job as a DJ. A week later, he was sent to Vietnam. You know, and uh, you know, and they it was in the PX, which is the post exchange where they sell records and everything to people who have a military ID. And it was there for like one day. I remember my civics teacher saying, "Go buy it. It won't be there tomorrow." She was like pretty cool. She was like a old lefty, and. Uh, Sure enough, she had bought like eight copies of it, yeah. You know? <laughs> and she like gave it out to people in her class who, you know, yeah. But um, so it, it, it did have power, you know, even though it might not have had organizational power, it, it struck at the heart of like the people it was trying to oppose. I mean, yeah. Imagine hits number one in 1971. Oh, so yeah, I right, just saw right? that, yeah, we, yeah, we yeah, yeah, did, yeah, so yeah. It, 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 and that's kind of interesting, that, that, yeah. That's another thing with John Lennon there, you know. Um, so there was moments when they came together, but you know, ultimately, I think the argument about whether or not it was a uh, revolutionary culture answered itself, um, and that's the nature of culture in a capitalist society, pretty much. Um, like my, I always like to say, it, it was sex, drugs, rock and roll, and revolution, and they got rid of the revolution because they couldn't figure out how to sell it. But you know, they're working on that. <laughs> I mean, you know, like how you can buy like. Ian and I, 
used to joke like you could buy the, the anarchist symbols in like the punk rock stores, you know, and it was like made in China with you know, this t-shirt to be a circle A kind of thing. But um, what happened with the with the with the more political wing? What, okay, was the new communist movement, and I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on the new communist movement, then I'm going to stop because I'm running out of energy. I'm running out of. It's, it's, I've been talking for a long time. Um, the the new communist movement was an attempt by multi, by the committed leftists, mostly Marxists, all Marxists people in the new left, to move the struggle to the next phase, to honestly try to understand Marxism, Leninism, and to apply it to the current situation in the 1970s America. Would you go along with that, Jim? That sound like a fair, yeah. And um, they, um, it was, it represented a multitude of understandings of Marxism. I would say the majority of them were Marxism, Leninism, Leninism, Maoism. Trotsky really had no chance. Um, be, um, for whatever reason, I don't know enough about Trotsky to, to, to speculate on that. The um, SWP was still on cohesive organization. Yeah, and they were still, was, yeah. They were yeah. the biggest Trotsky. Yeah. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of them just condemned like, the Vietnam struggle as like, Stalinist or whatnot. Right, right. Even though they were pretty be, involved in like the yeah, PCPJ and stuff yeah. like that for the May Day demonstrations in 71 and stuff. Although the yeah. European yeah. Trotskys were much more like victory to the NLF, NLF and stuff. But not here. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't like the SWP. Um, well, I, I was, they, so I would, I would say some of the primary groups in like, there's, I'm going to miss up, were the revolutionary unions, which came out of the Bay Area. Um, they ultimately, had, and you know, I'm, I'll say his name, uh, Bob Avakian. <laughs> yeah. um, Don't say Jimmy Hendrix. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what I like about when I lived in Berkeley, one of my favorite what, there was two two of my favorite graffiti. One was like "War is menstruation envy," and the other one was um, they, they spelled you know like you know how Baba my hair spelled is like Baba Avakian. You know, like you know like the guru and stuff. I, was, I always like that. Yeah, but um, at the time. Baba Vakin was a pretty major player in, in the Bay Area um, Maoist groupings, you know. I mean, he worked, and he was very closely aligned with the, the Newton, the Panther, the Oakland Panthers, and stuff like that. Um, they started producing, and they started, and, and there's two elements in the Bay Area Revolutionary Unions. There was the Baba Vakin group, and then there was the group of the guy who teaches at Rutgers. Um, oh, what's his name? He's a very good very famous, I can't remember his name now. But they went off into the hills of Santa Cruz to shoot guns um, because they decided that they were going to do an armed struggle thing, whereas Bob Avakian decided to do the mass organizing thing. Um, they started putting out these papers called the Red Papers, which are pretty interesting discussions of uh, theory and where, theory, where left Mao, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism theory was in the early 70s. Um, then there was some other groups. Um, the Line of March, the CWP, Communist Workers' Party. Um, October League? The October League, thank you. Yeah, October League had some pretty luminous individuals. They had uh, Donald Sutherland uh, was in there. So, and uh, were a lot of these, like the October League, like I was in the, Rev the Revolutionary Student Brigade, which was the student wing of the Revolutionary Union. And I, this was like 74 at University of Maryland. And they were always, a lot of our, me our meetings were spent dissing, discussing China and the three worlds theory and who was the greater imperialist, the Soviet Union or the United States. And I and the October League I think considered the Soviet Union to be the greater imperialist power. And you know, everybody else considered the United States. I really never really understood those I have to be honest, I really never understood why we were debating that um, when we were trying to fight faculty cutbacks and all this kind of stuff. But anyhow. It developed, there's some good stories out there um, of different people who got involved in, in the new communist movement, and I'm sure there's good stories in this room. Um, some of them, by the end of the 70s, were very involved in the Jackson campaigns, the Rainbow Coalition. Uh, some of them did not exist. Some of them ended up becoming like lunatic fringe cults, um, like that one that was uncovered in New York, in Brooklyn a few years ago. Um, and then we had, you had these other weird formations like the Larouchites who 
started with the national, what were they, the National Caucus of Labor Committees? But they, they actually generated originally out of the SWP. Yeah, uh, really? Really? Which was an SWP. really? And really? That they, makes a lot of sense. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. But they also have the distinction when they started Operation Mop Up, yeah. which was to attack other leftists, they somehow managed to bring the SWP and the CP together to defend each other. And those organizations hate each other. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it's yeah. like that's pretty that's impressive well, if you yeah. could do that. Well, we were in the um, when I was at University of Maryland during that time period. I was like 74, 75. Um, the NCLC used to come, and I would be at the table for the the RSB all the time, you know. And uh, they would come up and they would say, you know, do you want us to help us? You want us to go help us go take care of some. Uh, some professors, because they were going to go into the classroom, disrupt them, and beat up the professor and stuff like that. And we're just like, no, dude. <laughs> you know, like, no, dude, that's not going to happen. Yet. But anyhow, um, the R, you know, the R, the RU had probably had a, had the largest membership until they made some very basic, what I consider very basic mistakes, mostly regarding what was going on in the city of Boston in 1974, the busing issue. Boston. And that was one time when SWP was almost on the right side of things because they supported, you know, it was, it, and it, the, the, the fundamental thing, I think, I mean, I'm just going to talk about this for a second. The fundamental, found, the foundation of RU's argument was that busing was racist in itself because it was just basically putting the working class against each other, you know. But what, that argument ignored, in my mind, what was what was going on in the streets of Boston. I mean, because it was pretty freaking ugly, you know. I mean, Louise Day Hicks, you know, those kind of people and stuff like that. There was some pretty overt, open racism that was going on. Just to add one other, their suggestion was right that pitting poor, poor communities, working class communities, against each other, not not the suburban, like not yeah. the suburbs, yeah, right? Yeah, because so like, they were so like they were judges. eliminated after the judge did right. that right. This decision. Judge, yeah. Exactly. You know, not yeah. to say it was the right line, but just right. that was what allowed them to think. Fall for it, right? Yeah. But you know, RSB, RU survived. They became the Revolutionary Communist Party, the Communist Workers Party, which I think was an offshoot of another group. I'm not sure. Um, they organized the water round against the Klan in the South, and a bunch of them were killed by basically the Klan and the FBI in Greensboro. Um, and it was a it was a massacre that was covered up for a long time. And now there's actually, I mean, I, I was I lived down in Nashville, North Carolina from 2005 to 2011, and uh, there was actually, they were starting to commemorate what actually occurred down there. CWP was active in organizing textile workers. So that's why they were down south a lot. Once were killed. Yeah, yeah. How many were killed? Four? Four, I think it was, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I don't know, the history of labor organizing in the South and very much in North Carolina, and especially in that part of North Carolina, is a history full of, full of bloodshed. I mean, North Carolina has the smallest percentage of organized workers in the United States. It's like 0.1 or something like that. It's incredibly small and, and because it's such a, even under the, well, actually, what, what am I saying? Even under the Democrats. Um, it's just very anti-union state. Um, then I'll finish up with probably the best metaphor for what happened to the counterculture and the new left in the 1970s, and that would be the Symbionese Liberation Army, the SLA. Um, who knows what they really were? Were they a police plant? Were they true believers? Were they psychos? Um, <laughs> they, some of them had, I think, some of them had right wing background. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was a suspicion. Yeah, yeah, the Panthers hired a couple of private investigators. Paul Krasner, who was one of the original Yippies, but also the editor of the Realist until it ended. Um, PM Press just put is just put out like a little book of his where he talks about the what what they uncovered. You know, he worked with the Panthers and this woman, Max Fluesman, who just like who like was this conspiracy investigator who like um who looked up a lot of connections like between COINTELPRO and black flag stuff and so on. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, you know, so you always go, oh, I, like any conspiracy thing, you've got to read through these things with several grains of salt and stuff, you know. But uh, the, the Donald DeFries, thank you, 
um, had worked as an informant for the Los Angeles Police Department and what became CS, the California Bureau of Investigation. At that time, it was called the Security Services, and essentially it was the Red Squad of, of the California Highway Patrol. Um, and he had been involved in setting up, helping to set him and the, some of the groups he worked with had been involved in setting up the confrontation between the Black Panthers and the US organization at UCLA where Butchie Carter and one, one of the other Black Panthers were killed by some black nationalists, us, which turned out to be an FBI front too. Um, he was also involved in giving, or giving the FBI and the LAPD um, floor plans of the Panther um, headquarters in LA, which turned into and the Panther after, I think it was after sometime in 68, there was an attack, the LAPD attack, it was the, one of the first SWAT operations ever in the history of U.S. policing, where they, and a shootout went on for 16 hours, but because the Panthers knew what was going to happen, um, they were able to defend, defend their perimeter and nobody died. Um, and then there was a bunch of other questionable, like Emily and Bill Harris had been linked to right-wing groups in Indiana. Um, so anyhow, the SLA, to put their story briefly, you know, and then the fact that they killed Marcus Foster, who was a, a progressive um, school commissioner in, in the city of Oakland and that had been supported by the Panthers and several other left and progressive organizations, the Free Peace and Freedom Party, um, and, a, and a, just a ton of other groups, Ink Works, all sorts of people out there, Prairie Fire even. Um, but, so they killed him, and uh, then they just... They came out of a prison, prisoner group that was called Unicite, which was supposedly set up by the prison reform, prison system as a literacy group for prisoners. And they put Donald DeFries ahead of it. Sinku was, was ahead of it. And it was a way to kind of like bring white radicals into the prison system in, and um, teach. And they, ideally, it was to teach literacy. But they thought they were going into radicalized prisoners, but at the same time, data was being collected on them by the state regarding their connections. And it gets really foggy, I mean, you know. But anyhow, the SLA, most of them died, most of the active members died in a shootout um, in Calton. Um, I think, I want to say in September of 74. Um, it might have been later, it might have been 75. Um, and. Uh, then Patty Hearst and Wendy Yoshimura, um, after they kidnapped, right, right, they kidnapped Patty Hearst, right? Um, after they, um, they, they were on the run for a long time. Um, some interesting side notes to them being on the run was some of the hideouts they stayed at. Um, was, one was, uh, was supposedly Bill Walton was involved with it and stuff because he was good friends with Jack Scott, who was a uh, left-wing sports Guy, um, Jack Scott is kind of like a. He 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 was a, he was the athletic coordinator at Oberlin, and he tried to put in all these like non-competitive sports, and uh, like he he brought in Title IX before Title IX existed because he demanded equal funding of all sports for both women and men, and uh, he was involved in the uh, the uh, anti-apartheid movement to keep. South Africa out of the 68 Olympics and also in the human rights thing in the 68 Olympics at, with Harry Edwards and so on. So he was like very progressive, very left wing. And somehow he, he was involved in providing a safe house or something for, uh, for those two when they were on the run. And Bill Walton supposedly donated money at the time. Bill Walton, you know, he was always a counterculture guy. Um, in fact, this is just like a little side thing. When he was working, when he was playing for the Portland Trail Blazers, Part of his um, contract was that at least two songs during intermission had to be Grateful Dead songs. So <laughs> this is part of Bill's thing. But so that's it. I'm just going to.